All right. Hello, everyone. I would like to warmly welcome you to Inside Rx, a new webinar series where we focus on giving you a look inside Scholar Rx's products to help educators better understand our tools and to help you use them confidently. Today's webinar will be focused on the interplay between human health and the environment, equipping educators to prepare future healthcare professionals to effectively address the impact of shifting climate for the challenges they will face of climate change and environmental pollution. Today's discussion will take us on a journey into planetary health the Brick Collection, and will be led by two people who are passionately, um, who have passionately, sorry, collaborated to bring this very important collection to life. My name is Nikki Dalton. I am the Partner Account Manager at Scholar RX, and I am excited to be your host today. While our speakers are discussing the very important planetary health bricks, uh, or if you, or if it helps to think about them as learning modules. Think through how you might be able to integrate them into your curriculum, and we'll touch on that in just a moment. All right, so some of our audience may not be familiar with Scholar RX, so I do want to give you just a real quick overview. Scholar RX is a mission-driven organization that annually serves over 150,000 learners and educators with a digital platform that provides integrated teaching and learning modalities that are listed on the slide. The Scholar Rx resource we will be focusing on today is BRICS, or again, if it helps to think of them as learning modules, which you will soon learn can be used as they are or easily customized to fit your unique curricular needs. Katarina and Dr. McLean will discuss the Planetary Health Brick Collection, which is a part of Scholar Rx's message collection, which you're going to learn about here in just a moment. I do, though, want to highlight that the Planetary Health Brick Collection, along with all message brick collections, are free. And all you need to access and utilize them is to sign up for a free account. With that, I would like to introduce to you the moderator for today's session, Katarina Piath Rodriguez, Director of Curriculum Support and Training at Scholar Rx. Katarina has been involved in curriculum development and improvement of medical education for over eight years and has held different roles in pedagogical committees, which required her to become well acquainted with teaching and assessment methodologies, quality assurance mechanisms, and the challenges of curriculum implementation. Katarina is heavily involved in working with the International Federation of Medical Students Association, where she focused on global health topics and curricular gaps in health professionals education. Currently at ScholarX, Katarina focuses on supporting the development of education resources, ensuring they follow best instructional design practices, recruiting, training, and engaging students who contribute to Scholar RX projects. She also promotes meaningful student engagement in projects and coordinates educational content development on global health matters like the Planetary Health Brick Collection. With that, I'm delighted to welcome Katarina to the stage. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, as, a, as Nikki said, we're going to discuss uh, planetary health today. Uh, we're going to introduce you to the planetary health bricks collection, uh, describe a bit of the development of the, the planetary health bricks. Why did we just decide on those modules? Why are these modules important uh, to uh, address in your curriculum? And discuss how to integrate planetary health in health professions curricula. Uh, I couldn't uh, present this webinar by by myself as we couldn't have developed this collection uh, without uh, the help of Dr. Uh, Michelle McLean. Um, um, uh, we have uh, encountered Dr. Michelle McLean uh, while she was working with Amy, the International Medical Education Association, um, uh, and working on a consensus statement on uh, the importance of uh, planetary, planetary health education. Uh, Dr. McLean has uh, um, a long experience in health professions education uh, in different curriculum development roles and currently focusing only on planetary health. She's uh, um, uh, working at Bond University in Australia. Dr. McLean, I don't know if you want to say something uh, um, now. Yeah, thank you, Katerina. Uh, yes, I'm um, very early morning in Australia, but that's okay because I do get up early and it's a pleasure to be uh, um, it, uh, helping to advertise and to describe these these bricks, uh, planetary health bricks. 
I think uh, one thing I would say, Katerina contacted me and asked me whether I would be the academic advisor for some uh, bricks around climate change. And um, in some very early morning discussions, earlier than this morning, we um, expanded the said climate change is not enough. It has to be uh, much broader than that. And so uh, we decided, uh, I spoke to her about planetary health, and uh, we then rethought how we would do this. So that's what we're going to exp uh, explore today, some of those bricks and some of the reasons for, for planetary health being the broad concept in which today's health professional health professionals need to operate thank you and um yes so um that's uh so the way that we develop these uh message uh bricks uh is um by empowering student organizations that are part of uh the message uh consortium to identify educational needs and build innovative medical educational content to address them. So the uh, we do a needs assessment uh, with these organizations and they identify the, the topics. Uh, we don't work alone and we collaborate with, with experts. So uh, it was exactly what Dr. McLean described. Uh, the topic that was identified by the, the student organizations was climate change uh, and then Throughout the development, uh, we we have broadened that that concept. Uh, uh, we've talked about the broader concept of planetary health, uh, which we'll discuss with you uh, today. So, this is uh, a collaboration between uh, the students and uh, experts. We we also had some some reviewers, especially at the outline phase, uh, that were advocates in in the field of of planetary health. Uh, and these this is how we we develop. Uh, this content that is not currently covered uh, in most uh, medical curriculum. Uh, just so you uh, are aware, uh, we have the Planetary Health Collection, which we're going to discuss today, but we also have other collections on global health topics uh, and just relevant uh, topics for, for the current times, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sexual and reproductive health and rights, digital health, social accountability, uh, we also have a, a collection of bricks uh, to empower your students to become educators or to support your faculty development programs. Uh, so, so this is uh, we're trying to address uh, some 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 gaps and create uh, content in areas that we think are relevant for uh, future health professionals and and for health professionals that are practicing in in the present times. So. Why planetary health? And Dr. McLean has introduced this conundrum, so <laughs> I'll just uh, let her uh, answer that. Yeah, so Katerina kindly put together some slides, which and I filled in a few of the uh, the gaps with uh, images uh, because I think uh, pictures tell a thousand words. So trying to explain these verbally uh, without images is um, is difficult. So the first question that Katerina had had for me, why is it important to consider the broader concept of planetary health and just not climate change? So planetary health, um, and uh, some more will come in the next slide, is uh, is this broadest concept that pulls together everything, planet, uh, global health, public health, one health, eco health, all into one, one umbrella. And the importance of this is that, yes, that image in the center is because um, uh, we depend so intensely on our, our natural environment. We get our basic needs from that. So what we need, clean water, clean air, we need food, we need clothing, we need materials for um, housing. And we're at a, at a point now where we have uh, a triple planetary, well, triple planetary crises. We have uh, a changing climate. And as I sit here today, uh, we have fires down south, uh, up north, um, uh, a couple of hundred Ks up north from where I am. Um, two people have already died. The fire has gone through some of the small towns and um, two people have died as a consequence and about five houses were um, destroyed. And this is because Australia is now in um, El Nino, and so it's going to be super dry. There are going to be droughts. People, farmers are going to lose crops. There are going to be bushfires all over. It's not the first. There's been a couple, but this is the one where it's um, serious. So it's on our in Australia. It's on our doorstep. We had the summer the summer fires of uh, black summer fires of 2019, 2020, 
and that was followed by floods and the floods were just 20 kilometers down the road from from where I live moving south and some of my students were involved with that they went down one went down to do his uh his pediatric rotation at a, uh, the, the regional hospital there. And he ended up having to um, cook food and feed people who were, were had to evac evacuate. So some of my students have been involved. So uh, planetary health, we have to think of it as this concept uh, that is around everything, every being within the, in the planet. So humans always, everything is focused on human health. But if we don't have the biodiversity, of plants and animals to support our needs, we're in trouble. And everything has the, the right to be here. It's not just about us. So uh, the image on the right is uh, what, what is uh, Johan Rockström and, and his colleagues over the years have been measuring the planetary boundaries, as they call them. And they've identified nine of them. And if you look at the image, you can see um, the, the green in the center. No, no, go, please go back. Green in the center is uh, the safe operating space within those boundaries. And you can see that in 2023, because this came out a couple of weeks ago, we have exceeded six of those planetary boundaries, which means we've either polluted them, uh, polluted those boundaries, as in terms of the novel entities, which are all our synthetic chemicals, like uh, uh, the microplastics and the forever chemicals that are now um, everywhere in the food chain and will impact on our health um, down the, uh, at some point. They're still busy researching how this is going to happen. And you can see that climate change, uh, we've gone past the safe operating space for climate change. The biosphere integrity is talking about um, the plants and animals, and the genetic means the extinction of plants and animals. So that's a massive uh, uh, transgression. Land system change is the deforestation which is often for uh, agriculture, for housing, shopping centers, you know, all the things that humans do, all our activities. Freshwater change, it, blue is our regular oceans and, and waters, and the green is the availability for plants to be able to work. So some groundwater, so you can see we've transgressed that. And the, bio, the biogeochemical flows are phosphorus and nitrogen, and this is largely the fertilizers that we use for agriculture. And those um, then flow off into the rivers and sometimes cause algal blooms and, and so on, which um, so those on things. So six of those boundaries have been transgressed and you can see ocean acidification is not far off um, outside the, the safe operating space. And then the other two are about stratosphere and um, atmospheric loading. And the, the fuzziness at the top means it ha we haven't quite uh, got uh, to measure all of it. It's probably um, a bit beyond that. And so you can see that looking at climate change, it's only one of many factors that are, that will impact on, that is impacting on our health and will continue to impact on our health. And the little um, quote at the bottom we argue that one simply cannot claim to be a healthcare professional without advocating forcefully for the planet. Planetary health needs to be included in all health professions. Education is a forthcoming chapter that I have in a book. And that quote um, comes from um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Prescott in 2019 and um, her colleagues, and I'm happy to share that with you. And it makes the claim that we can't just uh, be looking at uh, what are the health impacts um, or as health professionals of climate change, we have to also be looking, we have to be stewards of the planet because there is only one planet, there is no planet B. And so we have to look at what we've got because we've we've gone beyond those boundaries. So that's a long, to cut a long story short, looking at climate change as a, as a health uh, con consideration is not enough. So the next slide, should I just, uh, Katerina, should I just keep going? You can keep going. You yeah, go. okay. So, <laughs> Uh, the second question was uh, that Katerina asked me is what are the challenges that are faced in uh, trying to integrate um, health, uh, planetary health and health professions um, education? The first one is probably the way the word is used. So people will say, um, yes, we, we must, uh, we must uh, planetary health and, and looking at planetary as the adjective and health as the noun relating to the planet. And that muddies the waters because um, that's talking about the health of the planet. Whereas planetary health, as that little diagram in the middle shows, it is a field, it is an area, it's, it's a, a discipline, call it what you like. 
it is a it, it's there it has principles and uh, pedagogical underpinnings um, and so we need to think of uh, planetary health in this way not as the health of the planet if we're talking about the health of the planet we must use the health of the planet not planetary health and that that really muddies it um, the other on the left hand side the carbon tunnel vision um, is an, an interesting little uh, diagram so if we just we have this tunnel vision if we trans uh, transitioning to a sustainable society so that we live within our within our means within our resources and are not borrowing from next year and the following year because we we have too many things um there's been so much focus on carbon emissions everyone's talking about a net zero net zero by 2030 or 2050 or whatever the case might be if that's all we do if we, if we tomorrow reduce our carbon emissions to zero our problems will not go away. You can see all the other factors that are involved. And as I explained in the previous one, all the planetary uh, all the, pa the planetary boundaries that we've transgressed. So we've got to think about the much bigger picture. We've got to think about the biodiversity. And that little um, time to treat the climate um, and nature crisis as one in, um, indivisible global health emergency has just been published in BMJ. And it, and it's it, the, the climate... The, the changing climate and biodiversity are intimately linked. We've been deforesting. We've been uh, uh, um, draining our, our peatlands and our, our waterways for our purposes, and we've been interfering with the carbon sinks and the heat sinks uh, in, the, in terms of plants and these ecosystems. And so, of course, we're going to uh, we, we, we're going to exacerbate the climate change. So it's not just the emissions. We need um, we need forests and we need plants um, to to be carbon sinks and to be heat sinks. Many of our cities are concrete jungles. They're going to overheat, and Australia is particularly vulnerable to that because it's already 1.4 degrees, the average temperature above uh, the the 1910 uh, level. And so 1.5 is the in terms of the Paris Agreement is is one of the the sort of not quite a tipping point, but like if we get there, we're in trouble because that the climate, the Paris Accord said we keep uh, we need to keep the global average global temperature below two degrees, but preferably below one point five degrees. So we only want Australia is only point one away from that, as are many other countries. And so it's going to we, we're going to you know, hit, hit, a, hit a brick wall and feel those impacts uh, fairly shortly, particularly now with El Nino and, and, and droughts coming. So we have to consider everything, water, the whole whole lot. So that's, so those are the, the, the uh, as I said, the challenges is the, how do we define planetary health, making sure we're all on the same page and not just having this uh, tunnel vision of thinking about carbon emissions, but we have to think about the planetary biosphere and all the, the the planetary ecosystem as a as a made up of a lot of other ecosystems, and um and this little quote says health professionals have a role to do that because our environment is um our global environment is is sadly um, deteriorated has deteriorated thanks to many of our activities and so um, health professionals need to look at them together and so restoration of the natural environment is important. A really good example of where that is being done is in the NHS, the National Health System in the UK. They have NHS forests and around all their um, all their uh, healthcare facilities, they've been rewilding areas um, so that there's greenery around there and they also use them for patient uh, rehabilitation. So people who need to exercise, but also mental health patients, the best way to do that is to get out into nature and to be part of it, to enjoy it, but also to restore it. And so uh, that that becomes an important part of planetary health and health professions education is the activities, uh, is actively restoring nature. Okay. And I think this follows nicely, uh, which is, uh, with all of these different concepts and the tendency for for tunnel vision, and even when we we shared uh, the first draft uh, of the the bricks with you, uh, you brought in as uh, the concept to air pollution and water quality, extreme heat, which you already uh, discussed here. So 
Um, how can we, uh, the question for this slide is, how can we train students to recognize and respond to environmental determinants of health? Yeah, so uh, the little one I put in yesterday, UN General Assembly declares access to clean and healthy, a clean and healthy environment to universal human right. This was 28th of July last year. So every single person on this earth has has the right to a healthy, clean environment. And that does not exist in too many places. And we know that uh, what happens in one place so the you know the smoke will blow over the wildfires in Canada flew uh, um, was pushed across into into the U.S. and some of some of those cities had to be shut. People couldn't go outdoors. There were outdoors, no outdoor sport. So it's it's this is where the global um, perspective comes in in terms of planetary health is what, what happens in one place it has impacts elsewhere. And so, that, you know, recognizing that we sit in this world, big world, where we're all interconnected with each other and also with our natural environment. And so um, health professions education is really about equity and ensuring that everybody has fair access and, and access to, you know, everything. And that includes a, a clean and healthy environment. I say to my students, because we, we uh, Bond University has signed up to the the, the the 2030 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and so we have to in, incorporate them into our um, session, our lessons, and um, and do things. Uh, yeah, highlight certain ones, and you can educate you can educate all the women in the world, which is one of the um, the goals is educating women uh, gender equi equity. But if the, if those women have no access to clean water, uh, a clean air. And arable land to feed their children. You know what is the point of of that? So the environment becomes a really important determinant of our health. Um, on the top right hand side, there's a planetary health pledge, and that uh, if you have a little look at that and you you read, I'm just going to take our pictures away because I can't. Uh, I'll move it onto another screen. Um, our health professionals solemnly pledge to work to protect the health of people, their communities, and the planet. And so that's, you know, that's plan. It's not just about humans. It's about everything else because we depend for our existence on everything else in our ecosystems. I pledge to maintain the utmost respect for human life and the diversity of life on Earth and for the natural systems which support life. It's a, you know, that's all around ecology. So once upon a time, many years ago, I do remember that medical students had to learn about ecology and it's exactly what this is why they had to learn about it and then as the the more and more science knowledge came in and the curative sort of the side of medicine came in then all of this disappeared we've got to go back all the way back to going how do we promote promote health promote good ways of living um, so that we don't get into the hospitals which have a footprint we know that right we know seven percent of uh well between so it's in Australia, seven percent of emissions uh, from hospitals uh, contribute to um, the, the greenhouse gases, and there's a and there's a footprint. So this is around making sure that we respect everything in um, our environments. And early uh, before the Amy consensus statement uh, came out, uh, Judy McKim, who's been in who who does a lot of leadership uh, for uh, set and leadership courses for Amy and myself got together. And we thought, how do we how do we tr tr put the sustainability side of stuff with the leadership? And so we wrote this paper, Rethinking Health Professions, Education, Leadership, Developing Eco-Ethical Leaders for a More Sustainable World. And so there are two aspects there, not just the ethical, the equity, so that everyone is treated fairly um, in the world, uh, but also how do we do this in a sustainable way? And so it's not something... Like the, the the these things are not something that you you can you you kind of have to feel it. You have to have the passion for it. You have to. It must be like in your heart that this is what I need to do. Those are the values that will make sure that we we future generations have a world um, in which which is fair and um, sustainable. So uh, the next, uh, if you go to the next slide, so hopefully that uh, puts it in. It put this this kind of puts it into perspective. Um, so the eighty six uh, WHO Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion talks about ecology. If we want to promote health, it talks about this this reciprocal maintenance. 
for us to be healthy, we need a healthy environment, healthy planet, healthy people, unhealthy planet, unhealthy people. And so it says uh, to take care of each other, our communities and our natural environment. It's been there since 1986. In fact, it's been there since 1972 with the Stockholm Protocol that says man has a responsibility um, because the environment is so important. Our natural environment has a responsibility to um, make sure that, that the environment uh, is maintained. This little settlement map um, on the right-hand side, which we've used uh, for in the AMI consensus statement, shows you um, the global ecosystem. So just like you know, that this would be the, the like in the whole planet, the 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 land, the seas, the air, um, up into the stratosphere, because that's important. We need the ozone um, to protect us from um, the UV from the sun, and you can see climate stability and biodiversity are really important. And then it comes into the natural environment in that city. So this is the health and well-being of the city. So the trees and the, the waters and, and so on. And then it sort of comes, it comes down, it brings it down. And so as it, what is the most important determinant of our health? First, it's the environment, the state of our environment. It can impact us positively, that clean air, beautiful green areas that we can go and for recreation and for meditation and whatever we do in those areas, that, that therapy, but it can also be, uh, it's negative. If there's no clean water, no no clean air, we, we cannot be healthy. Um, and I just, in the middle, I've put the Geneva Charter for Wellbeing, which is what I introduced to our students right in the first uh, week or two. And it's very much nature focused. Um, uh, it's it's uh, real, you know, realizing that our environment, our natural environment, is such an important determinant of health, and so we need to preserve what there is, but we also need to restore where we have damaged it. So, so I, earlier I mentioned uh, the uh, the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. I have one criticism of that of that of that. Um, they're the global goals, and we do need to subscribe to them because it's it has a roadmap that we can we can all adhere to. But there's one problem. It's based on this model of sustainability, which is a weak uh, weak model. So so we this is what sustainable development is here, the intersection of the three. Um, uh, this would be environmental sustainability, economic sustainability or financial sustainability and uh, and societal sustainability, people, you know, about around people. Um, sometimes it's called people, planet and profit. Um, but when you say profit, then it already tells you it's business. So this is a business model borrowed. It's called the triple bottom line. We've been operating here. We've forgotten about this. Now suddenly they're saying, right, you've got to now have your sustainability plans. You've got to have green, you know, green stuff and you've heard greenwashing and what have you. People are trying, are scrambling to try and get to include this. If you take a strong sustainability model and bearing in mind what I've already said about our environment being our ultimate determinant of health, the, the planet nature and uh, environment is on the outside, then society. And the last thing that we um, worry about is profit. So if that's planet, people, profit, like that. That means uh, we can rearrange the uh, SDGs. Um, so here are the ones that are around the biosphere, the four, the, the clean water, sanitation, climate action, life um, on land, life um, in the water, then the, the, the society and all the ones around education, equity, and so on. And then um, the economy um, goes on that side. And that's called the wedding cake model of looking at the, S, the SDGs. Uh, next slide, Katerina. So what I've done at uh, Bond is I've translated that strong, strong sustainability model into what we call the eco-biopsychosocial approach to health and well-being. We in week two, I um, so I do an introduction to planetary health and and um, put out all the principles that Bond follows. We look at we use look at planetary health from an indigenous lens, and indigenous lens means that uh, it's a stewardship of resources, custodians of our natural environment. So a traditional ways of knowing, being, and doing, which is conservative, um, and and. Uh, um, so that's what we do, and I do that section, and then I go straight into health and well-being, defining health, defining well-being, 
and then uh, we go through the medical model that used to exist, and then for in, in then the biopsychosocial model, which is what one per, what most medical schools or health professions now use. That the person um, um, has has metabolism, so the bio, the psycho is the 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 um, to do with the general well being and mental um, mental side of things, you know, and then the social uh, is sits in a community um, and a family and so on. But the eco is an outside. So every time you take a history and you you need to think about environmental factors. So if someone comes with asthma, you've got to be asking where where are they from? Could there be smog? Could there be smoke? You know, all sorts of things like that. So the environment is a determinant of health in that um, particular area. And equally on the other side, if someone and, and one in five Australians has mental health um, problems, and so the, there's a lot of uh, there's a big movement uh, around green and blue prescribing. So go out there, go into nature, and uh, this is because this is this is where we, we're part of these ecosystems. But if that is is deteriorated, then it's not going to like we can't do that. So one of the best ways of dealing with uh, to do to do both sort of mental health and uh, uh, um, restoring the environment is to actually do that get people out there to be planting trees to be removing environmental weeds which cost a lot of money um, uh, because they just take over and and uh, it's just you know that's that's the stewardship the planetary stewardship that uh, we try and engender in our students okay so here's a list of the planetary health bricks. Uh, uh, hopefully with this presentation from Dr. McLean, you've been able to understand a bit of uh, the background and the way that we broke uh, broken down the, the topic. So we have this introduction to planetary health. Uh, there is uh, even the image that, that we had uh, of the planetary boundaries. Uh, it's It's there. Um, you, then you, you, we also have the different environment, uh, global environmental changes. And in each one of these modules, uh, not only do we try to characterize it uh, from a, a global perspective, we're also giving some specific examples from different parts of the world. Uh, and we also try to understand, okay, and what are the specific health challenges that, for example, uh, uh, a lack uh, of clean water, uh, poor, poor, poor water quality brings to um, people, and what can, how can physicians ad address this? For example, in extreme heat, uh, severe weather events. Uh, so really trying to characterize and really trying to to make uh, the the learner uh, understand um, these different threats to uh, uh, human health and and the importance of um uh as uh, as michelle was saying to to be custodians and and then we have these set of bricks um uh, these are all parts of, of the same collection but here uh we touch on uh different things mental health and environment climate migration and displacement disaster preparedness mitigation adaptation and environmental justice uh and uh these and health systems and the environments so uh, they uh, the, the idea here is putting it all together in terms of different, again, different kinds of concepts that uh, uh, we should be aware of um, to uh, address uh, the, the environmental changes and, and, and to uh, take care of our environment. Uh, and also, uh, again, trying to uh, present the, the characterize the issues and in some cases even use some uh, present some tools uh, that ha have been used, for example, in the climate mitigation uh, and adaptation. So uh, um, not only do, do we cover uh, uh, the concepts, but also some strategies that can be uh, implemented uh, by by students, by institutions. Uh, we we go specific when we talk about health systems and the environment uh, in 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 a similar way. Um, so that's the approach. And with that comes the fourth question, which is. If there's one brick you'd like our audience to read, what would brick, brick would that be? And also what others uh, other bricks uh, could be uh, added to, to the collection? Yeah, thanks, Katerina. So I've already uh, I've, um, highlighted it uh, in two different ways, bold and uh, italicized. 
And at the time when we were designing the, these bricks, environmental justice was uh, kind of like the buzzword. Uh, and that's what we were doing in our curriculum. Uh, but there, since then, um, we can we can now talk about planetary justice. And this little diagram on the top right with the three arrows, figure 4.1, shows uh, or explains what planetary justice is. And you can see three um, considerations. So justice beyond national borders, which is something I talked about. Um, and I have to say um, that, so just go, for instance, the world's top 10% of earners are responsible for between 25 and 43% of our um, environmental impact. The world's richest 1% cause double the carbon emissions of the poorest 50%. And the wealthiest 0.45%, which at the time was about 40 million, are responsible for 14% of lifestyle-related greenhouse gas emissions, while the bottom 50% of income earners, about 4 billion, um, uh, emit only 10%. So that's staggering, absolutely staggering. So there, there's justice right there and then, right, when you talk about it. So it, it, it justice beyond national borders, justice for non-humans, so for all the inhabitants, all the beings on Earth. I've spoken about that as a concept within planetary health. And then we sit now with these crises, these planetary crises, they didn't just appear overnight. It's taken decades. We've known about it, right? My generation, I'm a baby boomer. My generation is largely responsible for where we sit today because of um, all the industrialization and the just adding more things, not, not what we need, but what we want. And so there's a justice across the generation. So right now, who sits with the problem? The youngsters sit with the problem because it's the, they're the ones who have inherited it and moving forward to the future. So that's, and for their children, what is what, you know, and that we talk about and for future generations. So currently we need to have good quality of life, but so do future generations. But if we keep on doing what we're doing now, we got, we're in trouble, we, we, we're in trouble not too far in the future. So um, justice across generations comes into that. And this year, just a couple of weeks ago, another term was introduced, and this has come from the planetary boundary work, earth system justice, needing to identify and live within earth system boundaries. And what it says, it has an equity because the planetary boundaries initially said, oh, we, you know, we can't exceed these, but it didn't take into the account the equity, the justice around uh, people who are not, who have not contributed to the current state of our environment. We still need to be able to do stuff. So we can't ask them to be doing the stuff if they haven't really caused it. So it's making sure that we can operate within those boundaries, but that it's equitable. So that means a lot of pulling in the belt for people who have these excessive lifestyles because that's that's what's making the big footprint. So uh, it, it, planetary health is a fast-moving field. Um, it's uh, it, it, as you know, week by week, things happen and, and it takes a lot to keep on, on top of it. And so in, in terms of these planetary bricks, it's not static, right? Uh, you can keep on adding to them. So I that this is one area where go environmental justice is often about uh, people who are low income earners. And so they often end up in areas where there is pollution. Um, so, in for instance, next to highways, so you get all the particulate matter 2.5 you know the ones that cause all the lung problems and uh that's because they've been that the, the only places they can afford or the council housing is near these busy areas or in its in next to industrial areas so there's chemical pollution um the next step up is environmental justice so that's more around the ecosystems and access to ecosystems that a lot of people especially indigenous people of the world their land was taken away by through colonization and um, they became very marginalized and lost language and so on. And so environmental justice is about making sure that native title is returned to people. And I just have to tell you, more or less the figures, that the indigenous people of the world um, manage 20% of the, the our natural resources, land and sea. 80% of the world's biodiversity 
exist on those 20, that 20% of managed land. That's the stewardship and custodian, you know, the custodianship and stewardship that I talk about. And um, in North America, the um, the seven generation principle, I need to live in this generation now so that seven generations, hence, can exp can live the same way that I live. If that's not forward thinking, then I don't know what it, what is. So if we live by those principles, so the traditional ways of knowing, being, and doing, then we're we we there is a there is hope. Um, and so having that two eyed look at things, what do what do traditional owners and custodians and and stewards say? And then look at how um, sort of the Western ways can come together and be able to solve these problems. And so that's one area where where I think um, it could be, it could improve. And then I was just talking to Nikki in the beginning and, and you introduced the leadership. And I hope that one of the bricks in, in that will become the eco-ethical leadership because then that then it links back to these planetary health bricks. And I've just put the planetary health pledge back there because it, it lends itself directly into planetary health. It aligns with that and it also aligns with earth system justice. And I think we, I was checking the, the, the time and we want to give some space for, for, for a discussion, but just, uh, briefly, uh, uh, can you, uh, uh, just, um, uh, um, mention briefly, uh, why is it important to discuss the concepts of cl climate mitigation uh, yes. and adaptation in our professions education? So mitigation means that we, uh, is reducing. So then that's reducing our footprint. It, um, you know our greenhouse gas emissions so moving to more sustainable ways of of healthcare so this would be around the anesthetic gases which have a big footprint um desfluorane you know nhs has got the, the in the uk desfluorane almost doesn't exist the other one is a, a area they've worked is the um, mdis the multiple multi multi um dose inhalers for like ventolin uh, for asthma, going to dry powder inhalers, and most of the GPs in the UK now do that. So that's a big reduction of footprint. So that mitigation, energy, solar, you know, renewable energy for hospitals um, and health promotion, so people don't get to hospital. Adaptation means it's already we got problems. We already got problems. Some people have, you know, excess heat or lack of water, and how do you how do you deal with that? And uh, the resilience is that forward planning and having risk management strategies in place, understanding that you're in La Nina or El Nino, you know, that floods are coming and being prepared and having plans in place to be able to do that. The one that's really important here is the concept of health co-benefits. And this is around um, uh, if we promote health uh, and prevent illness, through um, when, with our patients, we have to be doing it for ourselves, right? We have to be role modeling healthy lifestyles. So active transport, cycling, walking to work instead of using your car and healthy diets, more plant-based, cut down on your meat. Junk food is dreadful um, in terms of its footprint, uh, environmental footprint. If we have those, we will then be able to mitigate many of the many things, the co-benefits of um, healthy lifestyles and health promotion. So I think, um, um, uh, Katarina, just go to the next slide. I've just got I've got some resources here that people can uh, access. So I did see the comments uh, from regist registry registrants, <laughs> and um, I was able to incorporate some of that into the things that I said. So the Amy consensus statement is really a roadmap around how 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 you do this. And I think if you and there, were, there are great examples. If someone doesn't have access to it um, uh, through um, Amy, I'm happy to provide them with a copy. So um, <clears throat> just email me. Um, my email is m-i-m-c-l-e-a-n at bond.edu.au. Um, the, second, the second one is uh, a little example of how very simply, we were able to incorporate planetary health concepts into a pre-medical histology subject just by having little facts every week. 
Um, so when they did an organ system, like if they did um, temperature regulation, it makes sense to just have a little fact there about um, heat, heat exhaustion, heat stress, and so on. And so we and and we um, did that, and we've um, that was just a little uh, experiment, and we've we've upped that and and now have another way of doing it in a in a more um, meaningful way based on those outcomes. And the second, the third one is uh, we. I just published uh, this guides and frameworks to inform planetary health um, education. So it's a, a rapid review of some of the models that uh, there are there. But in terms of planetary health, I think your best bet is to go to the Planetary Health Alliance and have a look at their model with nature in the center. Because we are part of the ecosystems. We are not separate from ecosystems. Nature is in the center and everything else you do is around that. So planet, uh, if, um, Nikki, can you find that Planetary Health Alliance and just put the link in there? I'm just looking, there's some. Oh, thank you, Rahini. Rahini said that uh, the brick collection is excellent and relevant for students. Yeah. Thank you. It's always good, good, good to know that. Uh, the content is useful. Yeah. And one thing we've tried with, uh, we've been conscious about with message content is uh, to uh, convey an interprofessional perspective. Uh, we, we need to broaden the alliance to actually have uh, other health professions contribute to it. Uh, but that's something that, that we have in our roadmap and, and something that we are already uh, conscious about when we are developing the content and the language that we use uh, exactly because we're not going to do this uh, together just uh, medical doctors just physicians no, but it, exactly I do um, a workshop for our workshop for the occupational therapists in our faculty and uh, we talk about um, ways that they can reduce their footprints of uh, for OT and one of the things is all the um, aids that that are are prescribed uh, for when they're learning to you know something's happened and they're learning learning to walk the same would be for physiotherapy these don't have to be new all the time right they can, they're reusable they just have to be disinfected and go back into into circulation and the other thing is a lot of um um is house calls and so if you schedule it so that when you go two or three OTs can go together or other health professionals to a particular area and see patients on the same day, not this way, and then take a two-hour drive that way. You know, it, the scheduling is important. Um, and there was something, and telehealth, right? Telehealth has become, from COVID, it's become now become part of uh, healthcare practice in, in um, Australia because some patients are not able to get to the the GP and also the GP doesn't need to go there or the other health professional doesn't need to go there. It can just be um, telehealth, uh, a telehealth consultation, which is much more effective. Um, it, it, we have a shortage of GPs here. So this this allows more patients access to, to healthcare um, through telehealth. So I see one of your set of bricks is digital health. So that's that's a really important way, um, you know, that that links in with sustainability as well. So there's all these links that I've been able to make with the different um, sets of bricks. Yeah, um, that's Jeff uh, asking, do you have suggestions for instructors who are trying to make the case to their deans about planetary health in the curriculum? I have to say that uh, <laughs> medical... In, in, so I'm in medicine, so a lot of the students with whom I deal are, are medical students. They have been activists and they have been pushing for this to be in the curriculum. And uh, there's so many, I call them educational activists, and, and there's so many that have that done such good work. Planetary Health Report Card is, uh, is now being done in so many different countries and also moving into other disciplines. They've got physio, they've got... Um, uh, a farm is coming on board as well because the footprint of of farm pharma of medications is huge. In Australia, it's nineteen percent of the emissions, 
And that's because there's over-prescribing or over-diagnosis and over-prescribing. And so if you can, uh, if um, doctors and, and health professionals are trained properly, then you, you can sort of get rid of this. Uh, so yes, I would go, the students are drivers of, of curriculum. The paper that um, Omnia al Umrani, who was uh, uh, from IFMSA, and she was also the first youth envoy for the COP conferences. So last year, COP28 in, uh, in, in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. Uh, she wrote on behalf of and a whole lot of other IFMSA students that how few medical programs have a climate change and air pollution in their curriculum. Uh, in 2020, only 15% had uh, climate anything around climate change and only 11% had something with air pollution. Now, air pollution is one of our biggest killers. Uh, something like 7, 7 million uh, premature deaths a year. And most of these are in um, low to middle income countries. So there's, a, there's an inequity there already, right? Uh, in terms of, of that as a huge global um, issue. So, so yes, Jeff, I think it's the, uh, through the students, but also every country should have uh, many, have they have the report on SDGs. So you can use the SDGs uh, um, as leverage uh, that we need to be doing this. Uh, many countries now have uh, um, um, net zero kind of targets, programs, you work through that. All universities should have have sustainability um, programs. In Australia, we've uh, we our, our new outcomes standards for medicine. We lobbied so hard uh, to get uh, get stuff in those that ca they came out in August this year. We've got planetary health, climate change, environmental determinants of health, sustainable healthcare in those um, in those uh, standards. So now I don't have to fight anybody. I go here. It is. It's in there. We got to do it. How is it different from One Health? Well, in that diagram that you saw, One Health was below um, planetary health. So One Health has come from the veterinary um, practices. And so it's really much more about zoonoses. It doesn't take into account some of the bigger pictures. So, you know, does air pollution come into uh, One Health? Um, in terms of animals, people, and the environment. Um, I just think take it one one higher, take it to the that the planetary health one to be all embracing. Eco health fits in there as well. Um, like between probably between one health and planetary health, the uh, the area of eco health, and that's very much um, driven by indig uh, with an indigenous lens. Is antimicrobial resistance covered? Any? Oh, so that's a question for the um, for cut uh, for Scholar X. Antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it's actually not covered in uh directly in uh in any uh, uh of the bricks. Uh, we uh because we were planning to also have the the collection that we're in development about health policy. Uh, at the time, uh, we were thinking more in terms of the strategy uh, towards antimicrobial resistances, uh, but maybe it's something that we can uh, include for uh, the next um, the next uh, uh, revision of the the collection is to to include maybe a brick uh, uh, on one health or or antimicrobial resistances. So and a lot of the, a lot of that resistance is from agriculture, the use of antibiotics in agriculture, not just over prescribing in medicine. But that's called a the evidence based practice uh, movement is around ra rational prescribing. Um, so rational, so not uh, trying to reduce over diagnosis and over over prescribing of antibiotics. A lot of that, and that is around educating um, health professionals around what they should and shouldn't do. I see there's a question: Why is it more and more? Why is it that more and more people are going away from this topic, not believing it? Um, the easiest thing is to put your head in the sand, and uh, and don't believe and don't believe it because then you don't have to do anything. But if, if we all had that attitude, then we're in big trouble. Every single one of us, my, my mantra is we need to be personally and professionally responsible for our footprints. 
So we can't be at work and be saying, right, I'm going to do sustainable healthcare, and then we go and waste food at home. Australians waste, the householder wastes 30% of food. 30% is thrown away. It's massive. It has a huge oh. impact on uh, you grow so thir- you're cutting down trees to grow food to then then throw away. So um, you know it's it's we have to be personally and professionally responsible for our individual for our footprints. Yep. I want to just let everyone know just because we have a couple of minutes left. Um, there was one question in here, and I'll let you answer it. Uh, do any of the bricks cover the underlying anthropogenic causal drivers? Uh, uh, drivers of declines in planetary health. And I'll, I'll let you answer that in a minute, but someone mentioned earlier was a certain concept mentioned in the bricks, but I just want to remind everyone. And I talked about this in the beginning, these bricks can be customized. You can annotate them, you can copy them and you can edit them to, to fit your population and your region. So, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that. And if you had a quick answer, I'll, I'll let you do that and we can close it out. Katarina, in, um, in the environmental justice, don't we do advocacy and activism? in that yes and we, so yeah. yeah in uh, throughout the bricks that's something that uh it is covered in the introduction to planetary health we talk a bit more about the anthropogenic um causes of uh the decline of planetary health and throughout the collection when we go into air pollution when we go into severe weather events there's always a, a mention we try not to be uh redundant but uh, accepting that some level of redundancy would be uh, important to to share the message. The the bricks also have the SDGs in them, so that's good. You know, because that we we need to stand as a global community to tackle this, and so that's a good way of doing it. Wonderful. I don't see any other questions. I'm gonna just. Uh speak just for a minute to close us out. So if there are any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we can, if we have time at the end, we can answer them. I just want to respect everyone's time. Uh, But first, I really would like to thank you, Katerina and Dr. McLean for a fantastic and informative presentation on the planetary health brick collection and on how to equip current and future healthcare professionals to address the impact of shifting climate Also, thank you to our attendees for your time and participation. As a reminder, we recorded today's presentation and any of the resources that were discussed will be shared with everyone next week. Also, just a reminder quickly upon the webinar's conclusion, uh, you'll receive a short survey. It'll pop up in your browser. Please just take a few minutes to answer that and add any of your ideas of how you think you can implement this collection in your um, curriculum. Uh, Our next office hours event is called Enhancing TBL in Med Ed. Integrating Scholar RX and into Dashboard on November 10th at noon. So uh, I think Kat just put in a link to that. But I just want to wrap up today's presentation with a heartfelt thank you to Katarina and Dr. McLean for your time and sharing your knowledge and obvious passion with us. Uh, Most importantly, though, thank you to the attendees for joining us today. We really appreciate you spending your precious time to learn how to better support your learners. So we plan to, of course, support you by continuing to provide more discussions and presentations and learning opportunities in the future. Does anyone, uh, Dr. McLean, Katerina, do you have any closing remarks you would like to share with anyone? I don't see any uh, questions. So no, I'm, I'm happy if anybody wants to email me directly, I'm happy to provide them with um, any resources that they need, because I do understand that the inequity of open source, uh, you know, like if you don't have open source, which costs a lot of money, you don't have access to journals. Some people uh, some in some parts of the world are not able to access uh, resources. So I'm happy to share those if they need them. Absolutely. Katarina, are you good? Yes, just thanking everyone for their time and uh, just check the the collection um uh dr mclean is available uh if you want to explore more about planetary health uh, and i'm also available to 
talk about any other message uh, brick collection or how you can adapt your your own content. Um, so just uh, let this be a spark yeah. um, uh, to your your enthusiasm to your enthusiasm on planetary health and. Yeah, I've just popped my email into the um, chat so people can find it. I don't know that I did it. It was anyway. Yes, we will make sure in our follow-up we we share that. In the chat earlier, I also shared uh, okay. what your webpage that you shared that has oh, all yeah, your Oh, yeah, paper. of course you do. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> I get so good to have it. <laughs> No, this is wonderful. All right. Well, I do not see any more questions. So again, thank you everyone for spending your time, whether it be early in the morning, like uh, Dr. McLean or in the evening or afternoon, wherever it is that you are located. Thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you all again soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye.